I never imagined a visit to my sister's new home would turn into a nightmare. It was supposed to be a joyous occasion, celebrating her newfound happiness with her husband, Mark. Their quaint little cottage, nestled amidst rolling hills, promised a peaceful escape from the city's clamor. Little did I know that the tranquility was merely a mask, concealing something far more sinister. The first sign of discomfort came when my sister, Sarah, handed me a peculiar set of instructions. Scribbled on a crumpled piece of paper, the ink smudged as if written in haste, it seemed odd from the start. Just follow them, okay? Don't ask questions, she said, her tone hovering between teasing and something more serious. I laughed, thinking it was an inside joke between her and Mark, a quirky game they played as newlyweds. The rules were straightforward but strange. Number one, don't leave the house after 9 p.m. Number two, always lock the basement door, no exceptions. Number three, if you hear scratching, don't acknowledge it. I dismissed them as part of their adjustment to a new home, assuming it was all for my amusement. The first couple of days were perfect. The cottage was charming, with a warm fireplace and a garden that soaked in the sunlight. Sarah and Mark's happiness was infectious, and I found myself swept up in the joy of helping them settle in, listening to Mark's childhood stories, and laughing until my sides hurt. But on the third evening, things began to change. I had lost track of time watching TV and only realized it was past 9 p.m. when I felt the urge to step outside for some fresh air. I brushed aside Sarah's odd rules without hesitation. What harm could a brief walk in the cool night air possibly do? The moment I stepped out, an eerie sensation crept over me. The temperature plummeted, not like a cool breeze, but a chilling cold that seeped into my bones. The moonlit street looked strange, as if the shadows had taken on a life of their own, stretching unnaturally like dark tendrils reaching for me. The once serene landscape now felt menacing, as if the night itself had shifted into something hostile. I hurried back inside, a knot of panic tightening in my chest. The peaceful ambience of the cottage was gone, replaced by an oppressive weight that seemed to cling to the air. Sarah and Mark remained blissfully unaware, their laughter echoing down the hall, starkly contrasting the fear that gripped me. I locked the door behind me, hoping to shut out whatever had changed outside. That night, I couldn't sleep. A strange tension filled the house, and I felt as if something was watching me, lurking just beyond the edges of my awareness. Then, in the dead of night, I heard it, the soft, insistent scratching coming from the basement door. I remembered Sarah's rule about ignoring the sound. But my rational mind took over. It's probably just a mouse, I thought. What's there to be afraid of in an old house like this? Feeling foolish for even considering the rules, I got out of bed and headed toward the basement. My hand trembled as I reached for the doorknob, the scratching growing louder, more frantic as if something was waiting behind the door. As soon as I opened it, a wave of stench hit me, rancid and thick. The smell was ancient, decaying, something far beyond what I expected. My stomach lurched, and my eyes watered as I peered into the pitch-black basement. I couldn't see anything, but a subtle movement in the shadows sent a jolt of terror through me. It felt like something down there was watching, waiting for me to make one wrong move. I slammed the door shut, heart pounding, trying to erase the sight from my mind. The odor lingered in the air, a nauseating reminder of whatever was lurking in the basement. The next thing I remember is waking up on the floor, my head throbbing and the basement door wide open behind me. Sarah was beside me, her face drained of color and filled with an emotion I'd never seen before, pure sorrow. What happened? I croaked, barely finding my voice. She hesitated helping me to my feet with a cold, distant touch. Her eyes shimmered with tears, but they also carried the weight of something far darker. You broke the rules, she whispered, her voice hollow. You let it out. Let what out? I asked, confusion clouding my thoughts. Sarah shook her head, her expression one of quiet desperation. Don't ask, she said softly, her voice cracking under the weight of whatever knowledge she carried. Just don't. She wouldn't tell me what I had released, what now roamed free. But her haunted eyes told me enough. Whatever I had disturbed in that basement wasn't meant for this world, and I had unleashed it. 
In the days that followed, I tried to push the events from my mind, but the scratching sounds and the faint stench seemed to follow me. Every shadow felt a little too dark, every quiet moment filled with a tension I couldn't shake. I left Sarah's house quickly, but the memory stayed with me. I knew I had crossed a line, one that should never have been crossed. Now every night I wonder if the thing I let out is still watching, waiting. I try to tell myself it's all in my head, but deep down, I know better. Some doors are better left closed, some rules never meant to be broken. And I'll carry the consequences of that mistake for the rest of my life. For months, I shared a cozy apartment in a bustling New York City high-rise with my college friend, Zach. We'd landed in the city with big dreams and even bigger student loan debts, and this little two-bedroom in a building overlooking a narrow, perpetually bustling street felt like our own little slice of the American dream. My bedroom window faced the building directly across the street, a stark, modern structure with rows of identical, gleaming windows. It was from this window that I first noticed her. She was a constant, a peculiar fixture in the otherwise chaotic symphony of the city. At her window, always in the same spot, stood a girl. She never moved, her figure eerily still, as if frozen in time. Her presence was unsettling, not because she was threatening, but because of the unsettlingly wide smile that perpetually stretched across her face. It was a smile that felt devoid of warmth a grotesque parody of happiness. At first, I brushed it off as a quirk of city life. Another oddity in the tapestry of strange and wonderful individuals that populated New York. It was a city where people walked around with painted faces, wore outrageous outfits, and played harmonicas on subway platforms. A girl with a permanently fixed smile seemed almost tame in comparison. But the more I saw her, the more the subtle unease grew. It was an unsettling feeling a prickling sensation at the back of my neck that I couldn't quite shake off. I tried to ignore it, to rationalize it away. Maybe she was just a mannequin, a bizarre prank. Maybe she was simply a girl with a neurological condition that caused her facial muscles to remain in a constant state of slight contraction. But then, one cool autumn night, I woke up to find her still there. The city was hushed, the only light emanating from the streetlights that cast a sickly yellow glow upon her face. She was clearly visible through my window, bathed in the artificial light, and the smile seemed to stretch even wider, as if acknowledging my presence. My heart hammered against my ribs, fear clamping cold fingers around my chest. The normalcy of it, the fact that she was still there in the dead of night, unnerved me beyond measure. It was like a scene from a bad horror movie, but the reality of it was too stark, too tangible. The next day, I mentioned her to Zack. He just laughed it off, dismissed it as the product of a sleep-deprived mind and too much late-night studying. You're seeing things, man, he'd said, a dismissive wave of his hand. His usual easy-going demeanor now had a hint of something else, something I couldn't quite define. As the weeks went by, I noticed unsettling changes in Zack. He became increasingly withdrawn, his easy laughter replaced by a hollow chuckle, his usual vibrant energy dulled. He'd often mumble to himself in the dark, his voice barely audible, flitting between words that made no sense. I'd catch him staring out the window, a strange, almost hypnotic focus in his eyes. One night, while lying in bed, I heard Zack's voice in my ear, but it didn't sound like him. It was low, conspiratorial, as if he were speaking to someone right next to me. I shot up, heart racing, my breath coming in ragged gasps. The apartment was silent, the only sound the rhythmic tick of the old clock in the hallway. It felt as though I'd imagined it, a product of my own growing paranoia. But the feeling of being watched, of being privy to a conversation I wasn't meant to hear, lingered. The next morning, I found a note on his desk. I'm moving out. His handwriting, usually messy and full of youthful exuberance, was stiff and precise, almost robotic. A cold dread settled over me. I wanted to confront him, to ask him what was going on, but something held me back. An inexplicable sense of foreboding, like the silence before a storm. That night, a sharp knock echoed against my bedroom window. 
My heart leaped into my throat. Hesitantly, I opened the window, and there they were. Zack, his face strained of color, stood beside the girl. The smile, that grotesque parody of happiness, was even more pronounced on her face, her eyes devoid of any human emotion. They were both staring at something behind me, their fingers pointed, as if beckoning me to look. Hey, Ryan! Come join us! Zack called, his voice dripping with an unsettling cheer, a manic energy that sent chills down my spine. I heard the whisper again, this time crystal clear, as though it were in my own mind. It's time to play. My breath hitched in my throat. Slowly I turned. In the glass, I caught a glimpse of my own reflection. It wasn't my face staring back at me, my own startled expression. It was hers. The girl's. Her smile, impossibly wide, stretched across my features, her eyes, now dark and empty, beckoning me closer. A wave of nausea washed over me as I realized what was happening. The girl wasn't just watching me, she was taking me. She was consuming me, slowly, subtly. The fear in my chest morphed into a terrifying acceptance. The whisper echoed in my mind, louder now, insistent, pulling me towards the unknown, towards the darkness. It was time to play. The next few days were a blur. I remember Zack's face, his desperate pleas for me to join, to become one with them. The whispers, the relentless tugging at my mind, a slow, creeping corruption that twisted my thoughts and desires. My friends tried to reach out, concerned by my abrupt silence and changed demeanor, but I couldn't talk, couldn't explain. It was as if something had severed the link between my thoughts and my words, leaving me a vessel for something else. I lived a double life. In the outside world, I was Ryan, a normal guy, a student, a friend. But in the quiet hours, as the darkness crept in, I would transform. The girl's smile, her vacant eyes, would become my own. The whispers would grow louder, more insistent, guiding me towards the precipice of something I couldn't even begin to understand. I started to see the world through her eyes, or rather, through the eyes of whatever entity was inhabiting my body. The mundane became imbued with a strange significance, the bustling street a stage for a play I was forced to perform. The city lights were a symphony of beckoning signals, the rhythm of the human heart a monotonous beat to a song of encroaching darkness. Days bled into weeks, weeks into months. My friends became increasingly worried, but my replies were clipped, empty. I could feel their concern, their sadness at the gradual erosion of the person I used to be. I felt a pang of guilt, a desperate longing for the life I had lost. But it was too late. The girl, the whisper, had taken root, had entwined itself into the very fabric of my existence. The city, once a vibrant playground of dreams and ambition, became my prison. I was trapped, a puppet dancing to an invisible master's tune. My reflection in the glass, once a reassuring familiarity, was now a horrifying reminder of my loss a constant, unsettling reminder of the girl's smile, the whisper's pull. One evening, I found myself standing at my window, facing the building across the street. The apartment was empty, the window dark. She was gone. The whisper, however, remained. It was a constant companion, a familiar ache in the core of my being, a chorus of whispers that filled the silence of my soul. It was my new reality. I look out at the city lights at the endless rows of windows, and wonder if there are others like me, others who have been touched, consumed by the darkness. Perhaps they, too, are lost in the symphony of the city, their faces frozen in a perpetual smile, their eyes reflecting the emptiness of the void. I am a constant, a silent fixture in the otherwise chaotic symphony of the city, a reminder that even amidst the bright lights and the bustling crowds, the darkness can find a way to bloom. And sometimes, it chooses a heart that seems, on the surface, the most ordinary of all. And I am living proof of that. The whisper remains, a constant companion, a chilling reminder of the girl at the window, the price of a single glimpse into the unknown. And it's time to play. It was late January when it happened one of the coldest nights in recent memory. Snow had been falling for hours, 
blanketing the neighborhood in silence. The house felt unusually quiet, the only sound being the hum of the baby monitor next to me as I watched TV in the living room. I was exhausted from a long day of caring for my newborn, Luke, who was barely four months old. Tyler, my husband, was working the graveyard shift at the local factory, a job he had taken on recently to make ends meet after Luke was born. His shift started at midnight, leaving me alone in the house until early morning. Most nights I didn't mind, I had grown used to it. But there was something unsettling about this night, something that crawled under my skin and lingered in the air, making every creak of the old house feel ominous. It was just past 2 a.m. when the knocking began. At first, I thought I was imagining it, just some random noise outside. But the banging persisted, louder, more insistent. My heart immediately started racing. Who would be knocking at this hour? I muted the TV and strained to listen, my mind racing with the possibilities. Maybe it was Tyler. Maybe he forgot something and had come home early. Or maybe it was a neighbor with an emergency. But when I glanced at my phone, there were no texts or calls from Tyler. That's when I realized something wasn't right. I walked slowly to the back door, careful not to make a sound. As I approached, I could hear a woman's voice outside, frantic, almost desperate. Please, please open the door. I need help. Her voice was muffled through the door but clear enough to make out her words. He's going to find me. Please, let me in. I hesitated, every instinct in my body screaming at me not to open the door. The woman continued knocking, her voice growing more panicked. He beat me. I can't go back out there. Please, help me. I reached for the door handle but stopped short, my hand trembling. Something about the situation didn't sit right with me. She sounded terrified, but there was a strange edge to her voice, a tension that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. My mind raced back to stories I had heard growing up, warnings about people who used desperation as a trap. But still, what if she was telling the truth? I took a deep breath, speaking through the door. I can call the police for you if you want. Just stay here. They'll help you. The knocking stopped abruptly. There was silence for a few seconds, and I wondered if she had heard me. Then, the woman's voice came back, softer but more urgent. No, don't call the police. Please. He'll come back. Just let me in, just for a few minutes. I'm begging you. My pulse quickened. Why didn't she want me to call the police? Any sane person in her situation would want help. Something about the way she kept asking to come inside, as if that was the only solution, set off alarms in my head. I stepped away from the door, my heart pounding in my chest. Luke was sleeping just down the hall, and the last thing I wanted was to put him at risk. I grabbed my phone off the counter and dialed 911, my fingers shaking as I pressed the buttons. The dispatcher answered quickly, and I explained the situation in hushed tones, afraid the woman might hear me through the door. The operator assured me that officers were on their way and told me to stay inside with the doors locked. When I returned to the back door to tell the woman that help was coming, she was gone. Just like that. No more knocking, no more begging. I stared at the empty patio, a cold chill creeping up my spine. I checked the backyard, but it was eerily quiet the snow undisturbed. I felt a wave of dread wash over me. Something wasn't right. I locked the door, double-checking that every lock in the house was secure. Then I waited, my heart racing, every noise in the house amplified by the silence. Within ten minutes, the police arrived. Two officers knocked on the front door, and I let them in, explaining what had happened. They listened carefully, then exchanged a glance that made my stomach drop. You're not the first call we've had like this tonight, one of the officers said, his face grim. There's been a couple going around neighborhoods pulling this kind of stunt. The woman pretends to need help, and when people open the door, her partner rushes in. They rob the place, or worse. I felt my legs go weak beneath me. The idea that I had almost let them in, with Luke sleeping just a few rooms away, made me sick to my stomach. We've been patrolling the area— but so far, we haven't caught them. Just be careful and make sure you keep your doors locked. 
I nodded, my mind still reeling. The officers left after giving me their contact information, but the sense of dread didn't leave with them. I felt violated in a way that was hard to describe, like my home, my sanctuary, had been compromised, even though they hadn't gotten inside. That night I barely slept. Every noise outside felt like another attempt, another knock at the door. I kept imagining what would have happened if I had opened it, if I had let that woman in. Tyler came home at 7 a.m. to find me sitting in the living room, wide-eyed and clutching the baby monitor like a lifeline. I explained everything to him, and his face turned pale as he listened. We installed a security system the very next day. But even with the cameras, the locks, and the alarms, I never quite felt the same. That night had shaken me to my core. The sense of safety I once had in my own home was shattered, replaced with a gnawing fear that someone might be out there, waiting for another opportunity to knock. To this day, the memory of that woman's voice still haunts me. I can still hear her begging, pleading for help. And every time I think about it, I wonder how many other people fell for it, how many others didn't trust their instincts and opened the door. What could have happened to me, to Luke, had I been just a little more trusting? I don't even want to imagine. Working late at a warehouse in the port of Baltimore. I had taken a temporary job organizing inventory for an upcoming shipment, hoping to earn a few extra bucks before the holiday season. At 27, I was eager but also nervous, navigating the sprawling expanse of towering shelves filled with boxes and the oppressive silence that enveloped the space. The warehouse had a reputation, a murky history that the older employees liked to share, laden with tales of strange occurrences. Built in the early 1900s, it had once served as a bustling hub during the Prohibition era, where smuggling goods was common. But as I brushed off the stories as mere urban legends, I couldn't shake the unease that settled in my stomach the moment I stepped inside. The atmosphere was tense, the air heavy with the musty smell of rust and aged wood. Fluorescent lights flickered intermittently above, casting eerie shadows that danced ominously across the concrete floor. I had spent the day working alongside a couple of other employees, but as the clock inched closer to midnight, they finished their tasks and left, leaving me alone in the cavernous space. My heart pounded in my chest as I pushed a cart filled with boxes down an aisle, the rhythmic echo of my footsteps resonating through the vast emptiness. I couldn't shake the feeling of isolation, amplified by the towering shelves that seemed to close in around me. Each box I organized reminded me of the thousands of forgotten items that had passed through the warehouse over the years, stories locked away within their cardboard confines. As I sorted through the inventory, a sudden chill crept down my spine. I brushed it off, attributing it to the cold concrete floors beneath my feet. But then, out of nowhere, a series of loud bangs reverberated through the empty warehouse. It sounded like something heavy had fallen a cacophony that shattered the stillness. My heart raced as I paused, straining to listen for any sign of life, but only silence met my ears. Just the old building settling. I muttered to myself, trying to quell my rising anxiety. I resumed my work, but the feeling of being watched crept over me, an unwelcome companion in my solitude. The shadows in the corners of the warehouse seemed to grow darker, more pronounced, as if they were alive lurking just beyond the reach of my flashlight. Just then, the overhead lights flickered again, plunging the area into darkness for a heartbeat before returning. I squinted against the harsh light as it flickered back to life, casting everything in a sickly hue. My instincts screamed at me. This wasn't just faulty wiring. Taking a deep breath, I moved to the far end of the warehouse, where I needed to retrieve more boxes. As I walked, I began to hear whispers faint yet unmistakable. They swirled around me, seemingly coming from every direction, echoing off the cold concrete walls. Help us! One voice pleaded, while another hissed. Get out! The hairs on my neck stood on end, and a cold sweat broke out across my forehead. I turned on my phone's flashlight, scanning the dimly lit space, but found nothing. Panic surged through me, and I quickened my pace back toward the entrance each step echoing ominously in the silence. When I reached the front of the warehouse, 
I froze in horror. Every single box that had been neatly stacked was now knocked over, scattered across the floor as if a storm had swept through. It was a chaotic sight, and I was the only witness to it. My heart raced as I spent the next few minutes frantically picking everything up, my hands trembling, my breath coming in quick gasps. As I worked, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was not alone. The whispers grew louder, more insistent, echoing in my mind. Help us! Get out! It was as if the very walls were crying out, their long-buried secrets clawing to the surface. I paused again, glancing around, and for a fleeting moment, I thought I saw a shadow move just out of the corner of my eye. Stop it! I whispered to myself, trying to maintain some semblance of control. It's just your imagination. But I knew better. I felt the weight of something unseen, pressing down on me. After a few minutes, I managed to tidy up the area, but the anxiety knotted in my stomach refused to ease. The whispers faded, leaving behind an unsettling silence that felt heavier than before. I glanced at my watch, just a little past midnight. I couldn't bear the thought of staying any longer, so I gathered my things and headed toward the exit. Just as I reached for the door, the lights flickered again, this time plunging the warehouse into complete darkness. Panic gripped me, and I fumbled for my phone, turning on the flashlight again. The beam of light cut through the darkness, revealing the familiar contours of the warehouse, but it felt different, like the shadows were closing in, suffocating me. Hello? I called out, my voice trembling. The silence answered back, thick and oppressive. I took a deep breath, trying to steady myself, but my heart raced faster, drumming against my ribs. Help us! The whisper echoed closer now, a desperate plea that sent chills racing down my spine. I backed away, my instincts screaming at me to run, but my feet felt like lead. I felt the cold brush of air against my skin, almost like a presence brushing past me. The flashlight flickered, and in that moment, I caught a glimpse of something, an outline, a figure standing at the far end of the aisle, just beyond the edge of the light. Get out! The voice hissed again, more urgent now. Adrenaline surged through me, and I finally broke free from the paralysis that held me captive. I turned and ran, sprinting toward the exit, my heart pounding in my ears. I could hear the sound of my footsteps pounding against the concrete, mingling with the echoes of those haunting whispers. Bursting through the door, I stumbled outside into the cool night air, gasping for breath. I turned back to look at the warehouse, its dark silhouette looming against the dimly lit sky. I couldn't shake the feeling that something had been watching me, waiting for me to leave. The experience had shaken me to my core, and I knew I would never return. In hindsight, I learned that the Port of Baltimore had a dark history. This warehouse, like many others in the area, was once used during prohibition for smuggling goods, where desperate individuals fought for survival. Some employees claimed to have experienced strange phenomena, objects moving, disembodied voices, and flickering lights. It was said that the spirits of those who had suffered or lost their lives during those tumultuous times remained trapped in the building. Over the next few days, I couldn't shake the experience from my mind. I found myself driving past the warehouse on my way home, the memories clawing at my subconscious. I decided to do some digging into its history hoping to rationalize the events of that night. As I delved deeper, I discovered tales of a violent past, stories of labor disputes that ended in tragedy, where workers had lost their lives under mysterious circumstances. Some locals even spoke of a fire that had ravaged part of the warehouse decades ago, leaving behind charred remnants of its history. One evening, driven by a mix of curiosity and dread, I returned to the area, standing outside the warehouse under the pale glow of the streetlights. The air was thick with a sense of foreboding, and I felt a chill race down my spine as I stared at the building. It looked the same, but now it felt like a living entity, one that had swallowed countless stories and secrets within its walls. As I turned to leave, a sudden gust of wind blew past me, and I heard it again, soft whispers, swirling around me like leaves in a storm. Help us! Get out! I froze, a chill wrapping around me as I realized the voices were coming from inside the warehouse. The stories I had dismissed as folklore now felt frighteningly real. I stumbled back, 
heart pounding, and sprinted to my car, my breath coming in panicked gasps. I vowed never to return, but the whispers followed me home, echoing in my dreams, a haunting reminder of the darkness that could reside in even the most unassuming places. Days turned into weeks, and though I tried to put the experience behind me, it lingered like a shadow, haunting my thoughts. I spoke to a few friends about it, and they dismissed my story with laughter, telling me I was overreacting to an old building. But deep down, I knew what I had felt was real. The whispers became a part of my daily life, invading my thoughts at odd moments, reminding me of the night I had felt something otherworldly in that warehouse. My work at the temp job ended, but the shadows and whispers remained, tethering me to that night, to the spirits that seemed to call out from the dark corners of the port of Baltimore. As time passed, I realized the experience had changed me. The once mundane task of inventory organization had transformed into a chilling reminder of the past, forcing me to confront the unknown. I still wondered what I truly experienced that night. Was it simply my imagination, fueled by fatigue and stress, or was there truly something sinister lurking within the walls of that warehouse? As the weeks turned into months, I made a conscious effort to avoid that part of town. But the pull of the port of Baltimore was undeniable. One night, against my better judgment, I found myself drawn back to the area, curiosity outweighing the fear that had gripped me for so long. The warehouse loomed in the darkness like a sentinel, its silhouette stark against the starry sky. I parked my car at a safe distance, the engine idling softly, and sat in silence, staring at the structure. Memories of that fateful night flooded back, whispers that echoed in my mind, the feeling of being watched, and the chaotic scene of scattered boxes. Suddenly, I saw a light flickering inside the warehouse. My heart raced as I squinted through the darkness. It couldn't be an employee. I knew the place was closed for the night. Stealing my nerves, I grabbed my phone for light and stepped out of my car. The cold air bit at my skin, heightening my senses as I walked toward the building. As I approached, I felt that familiar chill creep over me, a palpable tension that thickened the air. The flickering light came from the far side of the warehouse, a dull, wavering glow that seemed to pulse with an eerie energy. I hesitated at the entrance, my instincts screaming for me to turn back. But curiosity pulled me in. I stepped inside, and the atmosphere shifted, becoming suffocatingly heavy. The flickering lights buzzed overhead, casting elongated shadows that danced menacingly along the walls. I called out, Hello? My voice echoed back at me, swallowed by the vastness of the warehouse. With each step, the whispers grew louder, swirling around me like a tempest. Help us! Get out! They were clearer now, more desperate. I aimed my phone's flashlight toward the source of the flickering, revealing an open office door at the end of a narrow aisle. Compelled by an unknown force, I walked down the aisle, my breath quickening as the shadows closed in. I stepped into the office, and the flickering light revealed a scene that froze me in my tracks. Papers were scattered across the desk, as if someone had left in a hurry, and a small radio played softly in the background. But it was the sight of an old photograph that caught my attention. I picked it up, revealing a group of workers from decades ago, standing proudly in front of the warehouse. Their faces were weathered, and their eyes seemed to follow me, a knowing look in their gazes. Beneath the photograph, an inscription read, In memory of those who toiled and suffered. My heart raced as the reality of what I had stumbled upon began to sink in. Who are you? I whispered, looking around the room as if expecting someone to answer. The whispers intensified, swirling around me in a cacophony of voices, pleading for recognition, for acknowledgement of their pain. Suddenly, the radio crackled to life, and a voice broke through the static. Get out! It boomed, echoing through the small office, sending chills racing down my spine. The lights flickered violently, casting erratic shadows that danced menacingly on the walls. I dropped the photograph, my heart pounding wildly as I stumbled back. The whispers escalated into a deafening roar, a cacophony of despair that enveloped me. I turned to run the shadows clawing at my back as I sprinted down the narrow aisle, my heart pounding in my chest. Just as I reached the entrance, the lights went out completely, plunging me into darkness. 
Panic surged through me as I fumbled for my phone, the beam of light barely piercing the void. I burst through the door and into the night, gasping for breath as I stumbled to my car, my pulse racing. I fumbled with my keys, my hands trembling, desperate to escape. I could still hear the whispers, the cries for help lingering in the air like a shroud. As I sped away from the warehouse, I glanced in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see something, someone, watching me from the shadows. But there was nothing, only the looming darkness of the warehouse fading into the distance. The drive home was a blur, my mind racing with questions and fears. Had I really experienced what I thought? Or was it all a figment of my imagination, a manifestation of my own anxiety? Despite my attempts to rationalize it, a chilling realization settled over me. Something within that warehouse was reaching out, desperate to be heard. Over the next few weeks, I immersed myself in researching the history of the Port of Baltimore and the warehouse itself. I learned of labor strikes, mysterious accidents, and workers who had lost their lives under tragic circumstances. It became clear to me that the voices I had heard were not just echoes of my imagination. They were the remnants of those who had suffered within those walls, seeking acknowledgement and understanding. Driven by a newfound purpose, I decided to document my experiences and the stories of the warehouse. I reached out to local historians and former employees, piecing together the fragmented history of the place. Each story added depth to my understanding, revealing a haunting legacy that had been long forgotten. Months later, I organized a community event at the warehouse, inviting locals to come and share their own stories and experiences. As the night unfolded, the atmosphere shifted from one of fear to solidarity. People gathered to honor those who had come before us, sharing tales of struggle, loss, and resilience. That night, I stood in the center of the warehouse, surrounded by flickering candles and the soft murmur of voices. I felt a profound sense of connection to the spirits of the past, a recognition of their pain that had once echoed through the shadows. As I spoke, I could almost hear their whispers mingling with the wind a soft chorus of gratitude and relief. The darkness that had once terrified me now felt like a bridge to the past, a reminder of the importance of remembrance and honoring those who had suffered. I realized that my fear had transformed into a sense of purpose. The warehouse, once a symbol of terror, had become a space of healing, a place where voices could be heard and stories shared. The shadows no longer felt threatening. They were simply a reminder of the lives that had shaped the history of the Port of Baltimore. In the months that followed, the whispers faded, replaced by a sense of peace that lingered in the air. I continued to return to the warehouse, not as a haunted visitor but as a steward of its history. I had learned to embrace the darkness, to recognize the importance of those who had come before me. Three years later, I still think about that night when everything changed. The Port of Baltimore— and its warehouse will always hold a special place in my heart. They taught me that fear can lead to understanding, and that sometimes, the voices from the past are simply waiting to be heard.